chapter 3, of the relation which the prophecy of John hath to those of Daniel, and of the subject of the prophecy. The whole scene of sacred prophecy is composed of three principal parts. The regions beyond Euphrates, represented by the two first beasts of Daniel, the empire of the Greeks on the side of Euphrates, represented by the leopard and by the he-goat, and the empire of the Latins on this side of Greece, represented by the beast with ten horns. And to these three parts, the phrases of the third part of the earth, sea, rivers, trees, ships, stars, sun, and moon relate. I place the body of the fourth beast on this side of Greece, because the three first of the four beasts had their lives prolonged after their dominion was taken away, and therefore belong not to the body of the fourth. He only stamped them with his feet. By the earth, the Jews understood the great continent of all Asia and Africa, to which they had access by land, and by the isles of the sea. They understood the places to which they sailed by sea, particularly all Europe, and hence in this prophecy, the earth and sea are put for the nations of the Greek and Latin empires. The third and fourth beasts of Daniel are the same with the dragon and ten-horned beast of John, but with this difference, John puts the dragon for the whole Roman Empire while continued entire because it was entire when that prophecy was given, and the beast he considers not till the empire became divided, and then he puts the dragon for the empire of the Greeks and the beast for the empire of the Latins. Hence it is that the dragon and beast have common heads and common horns, but the dragon hath crowns only upon his head and the beast only upon his horns. Because the beast and his horns reign not before they were divided from the dragon, and when the dragon gave the beast his throne, the ten horns received power as kings, the same hour with the beast. The heads are seven successive kings. Four of them were the four horsemen which appeared at the opening of the first four seals. In the latter end of the sixth head or seal, considered as present in the visions, is said five of the seven kings are fallen, and one is, and another is not yet come. And the beast that was and is not, being wounded to death with the sword, he is the eighth and of the seven. He was therefore a collateral part of the seventh. The horns are the same with those of Daniel's fourth beast described above. The four horsemen which appeared at the opening of the first four seals have been well explained by Mr. Mead, excepting that I had rather continued the third to the end of the reign of the three Gordians and Philip the Arabian those being kings from the south, and begin the fourth with the reign of Decius, and continue it till the reign of Diocletian. For the fourth horseman sat upon a pale horse, and his name was Death, and hell followed with him, and power was given them to kill unto the fourth part of the earth, with the sword, and with famine, and with the plague, and with the beasts of the earth were armies of invaders and rebels, and as such were the times during all this interval. Hitherto the Roman Empire continued in an undivided monarchical form, except rebellious, and such it is represented by the four horsemen. But Diocletian divided it between himself and Maximianus, A.C. 285, and it continued in that divided state till the victory of Constantine the Great over Licinius. AC 323, which put an end to the heathen persecutions set on foot by Diocletian and Maximianus, and described at the opening of the fifth seal. But this division of the empire was imperfect, the whole being still under one and the same senate. The same victory over Constantine, over Licinius, a heathen persecutor, began the fall of the heathen empire, 
described at the opening of the sixth seal, and the visions of the seal continue till after the reign of Julian the Apostate. He being a heathen emperor and reigning over the whole Roman Empire, the affairs of the church begin to be considered at the opening of the fifth seal, as was said above. Then she is represented by a woman in the temple of heaven, clothed with the sun of righteousness, and the moon of Jewish ceremonies under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, relating to the twelve apostles and to the twelve tribes of Israel. When she fled from the temple into the wilderness, she left in the temple a remnant of her seed, who kept the commandments of God and had the testimony of Jesus Christ. And therefore, before her flight, she represented the true primitive church of God, though afterwards she degenerated like Ohola and Oholiba. In Diocletian's persecution, she cried, traveling in birth and pain to be delivered. And in the end of that persecution, by the victory of Constantine over Maxentius, AC 312, she brought forth a man-child, such a child as was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, a Christian empire. And her child, by the victory of Constantine over Licinius, A.C. 323, was caught up into God and to his throne. And the woman, by the division of the Roman Empire into the Greek and Latin empires, fled from the first temple into the wilderness or spiritually barren empire of the Latins, where she is found afterwards sitting upon the beast, and upon the seven mountains, and is called the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth, that is, over the ten kings who give their kingdom to her beast. But before her flight, there was war in heaven between Michael and the dragon, the Christian and the heathen religions. And the dragon, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, who deceiveth the whole world, was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And John heard a voice in heaven saying, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe be to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea or people of the Greek and Latin empires, for the devil is come down amongst you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast down from the Roman throne, and the man-child caught up thither, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, and to her, by the division of the Roman Empire, between the cities of Rome and Constantinople, A.C. 330, were given two wings of a great eagle, the symbol of the Roman Empire, that she might flee from the first temple into the wilderness of Arabia to her place at Babylon, mystically so called. And the serpent, by the division of the same empire between the sons of Constantine the Great, AC 337, cast out of his mouth water as a flood, the western empire after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And the earth or Greek empire helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood by the victory of Constantius over Magnentius, AC 353. And thus the beast was wounded to death with the sword, and the dragon was wroth with the woman in the reign of Julian the apostate, AC 361. And by a new division of the empire between Valentinian and Valens, A.C. 364, went from her into the eastern empire to make war with the remnant of her seed, which she left behind her when she fled, and thus the beast revived. By the next division of the empire, which was between Gratian and Theodosius, A.C. 379, the beast with ten horns rose out of the sea, and the beast with two horns out of the earth. And by the last division thereof, which was between the sons of Theodosius, A.C. 395, the dragon gave the beast his power and throne and great authority. And the ten horns received power as kings the same hour with the beast. 
At length, the woman arrived at her place of temporal as well as spiritual dominion upon the back of the beast, where she is nourished a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent, not in his kingdom, but at a distance from him. She is nourished by the merchants of the earth three times or years and a half or 42 months or 1260 days. And in these prophecies, days are put for years. During all this time, the beast acted and she sat upon him that is reigned over him and over the 10 kings who gave their power and strength, that is, their kingdom to the beast. And she was drunken with the blood of the saints. By all these circumstances, she is the 11th horn of Daniel's fourth beast, who reigned with a look more stout than his fellows, and was of a different kind from the rest, and had eyes and a mouth like the woman, and made war with the saints, and prevailed against them, and wore them out, and thought to change times and laws, and had them given into his hand until a time and times and half a time. These characters of the woman and little horn of the beast agree perfectly. In respect of her temporal dominion, she was a horn of the beast. In respect of her spiritual dominion, she rode upon him in the form of a woman, and was his church, and committed fornication with the ten kings. The second beast which rose up out of the earth was the church of the Greek empire, for it had two horns like those of the lamb, and therefore was a church. And it spake as the dragon, and therefore was of his religion, and it came up out of the earth, and by consequence in his kingdom. It is called also the false prophet, who wrought miracles before the first beast, by which he deceived them, that received his mark and worshipped his image. When the dragon went from the woman to make war with the remnant of her seed, this beast arising out of the earth assisted in that war, and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the authority of the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed, and to make an image to him, that is, to assemble a body of men like him in point of religion. He had also power to give life and authority to the image, so that it could both speak, and by dictating cause that all religious bodies of men who would not worship the authority of the image should be mystically killed. And he causeth all men to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. All the rest being excommunicated by the beast with two horns. His mark is, we have it represented here in a, with three what look to be Templars crosses in a row. You'll have to look at that for yourself on Page 327. And his name, Latinos, and the number of his name, 666. Thus the beast, after he was wounded to death with a sword and revived, was deified as the heathens used to deify their kings after death and had an image erected to him, and his worshippers were initiated in this new religion by receiving the mark or name of this new god, or the number of his name, by killing all that will not worship him and his image. The first temple, illuminated by the lamps of the seven churches, is demolished, and a new temple built for them who will not worship him, and the outward court of this new temple or outward form of a church, is given to the Gentiles who worship the beast and his image, while they who will not worship him are sealed with the name of God in their foreheads and retire into the inward court of this new temple. These are the 144,000 sealed out of all the 12 tribes of Israel and calling the two witnesses as being derived from the two wings of the woman while she was flying into the wilderness and represented by two of the seven candlesticks. 
These appeared to John in the inward court of the second temple, standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb, and as it were on the sea of glass. These are the saints of the Most High, and the host of heaven, and the holy people spoken of by Daniel, as worn out and trampled underfoot, and destroyed in the latter times by the little horn of his fourth beast and he goat. While the Gentiles tread the holy city underfoot, God gives power to his two witnesses, and they prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. They are called the two olive trees, with relation to the two olive trees, which in Zechariah's vision, chapter 4, stand on either side of the golden candlestick to supply the lamps with oil. And olive trees, according to the Apostle Paul, represent churches, Romans 11. They supply the lamps with oil by maintaining teachers. They are also called the two candlesticks which in this prophecy signify churches, the seven churches of Asia, being represented by seven candlesticks. Five of these churches were found faulty and threatened if they did not repent. The other two were without fault, and so their candlesticks were fit to be placed in the second temple. These were the churches in Smyrna and Philadelphia. They were in a state of tribulation and persecution, and the only two of the seven in such a state. And so their candlesticks were fit to represent the churches in affliction in the times of the second temple, and the only two of the seven that were fit. The two witnesses are not new churches. They are the posterity of the primitive church, the posterity of the two wings of the woman, and so are fitly represented by two of the primitive candlesticks. We may conceive, therefore, that when the first temple was destroyed and a new one built for them who worship in the inward court, two of the seven candlesticks were placed in this new temple. The affairs of the church are not considered during the opening of the first four seals. They begin to be considered at the opening of the fifth seal as was said above, and are further considered at the opening of the sixth seal. And the seventh seal contains the times of the great apostasy. And therefore I refer the epistles to the seven churches unto the times of the fifth and sixth seals. For they relate to the church when she began to decline, and contain admonitions against the great apostasy then approaching. When Eusebius had brought down the ecclesiastical history, To the reign of Diocletian, he thus describes the state of the church. Truly, we could never adequately describe the nature and extent of the glory and liberty, which the doctrine of true piety towards the God of heaven, a doctrine first proclaimed to all by Christ, secured for itself everywhere, both among Greeks and barbarians. Prior to the persecution which began within my own recollection. While we might point to the kindness of the emperors towards our brethren, they even entrusted to them the government of whole provinces and freed them from all fear of having to sacrifice to idols. Such was the remarkable goodwill displayed by them towards our religion. And a little after, he says, but further, who could ever give a detailed account of the innumerable hosts of men? who daily found refuge in belief on Christ, of the number of churches in every city, or the distinguished congregations that gathered in the sacred edifices. The result of this enthusiasm was that, becoming dissatisfied with the ancient buildings in every city, they reared churches on a grandiose scale from the very foundations. In the process of time, these buildings were enlarged, and every day grew to something greater and better nor could they be harmed by envy, nor bewitched by the spite of the evil one, nor hindered in their progress by the unbelief of men, so long as the right arm of God Almighty shielded and guarded his people, and while his people merited such protection. But in time, our absolute freedom led us into negligence and sloth. Men began to envy and abuse their neighbors, 
we use to wage amongst ourselves a kind of civil war, wounding each other blow for blow with words instead of arms and spears. Priests against priests, peoples against peoples, stirred up feuds and tumults, in short deceit and hypocrisy, reached the highest pitch of wickedness. Then at last, divine vengeance gradually and gently began to stir against us. At first, with light stroke, as is its wont, the status of the church still remained unimpaired. The masses of the faithful were still at liberty to assemble, and the persecution first began against the militant party. But in our folly, we gave not a thought to appeasing the majesty of God but rather imagining like infidels that providence controls not the affairs of men. Day by day, we added fresh sin to that of the past. Our pastors, spurning the ordinances of religion, strove and quarreled the one with the other, setting themselves to nothing else than to widen the disputes, to increase their threats, and to intensify their rivalry. Passions and enmity they bore to one another, and with the utmost vehemence claiming for themselves the primacy as though it were by a kind of tyranny. Then it was that, in the words of Jeremiah, the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger, and cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel, that is, by the overthrow of the churches. This was the state of the church just before the subversion of the churches in the beginning of Diocletian's persecution. And to the state of the church agrees the first of the seven epistles to the angel of the seven churches, that to the church in Ephesus. I have something against thee, saith Christ, to the angel of that church, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans are the continentes above described, who place religion in abstinence from marriage, abandoning their wives if they had any. They are here called Nicolaitans, from Nicholas, one of the seven deacons of the primitive church of Jerusalem, who, having a beautiful wife and being taxed with uxoriousness, abandoned her and permitted her to marry whom she pleased, saying that we must disuse the flesh, and thenceforward lived a single life in continency as his children also. The continentes Afterwards embraced the doctrine of eons and ghosts male and female and were avoided by the churches till the 4th century. And the church of Ephesus is here commended for hating their deeds. The persecution of Diocletian began in the year of Christ 302 and lasted 10 years in the Eastern Empire and 2 years in the Western. To this state of the church, the second epistle to the church of Smyrna agrees. I know, saith Christ, thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. The tribulation of ten days can agree to no other persecution than that of Diocletian, it being the only persecution which lasted ten years. By the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan, I understand the idolatries of the Nicolaitans, who falsely said they were Christians. The Nicolaitans are complained of also in the third epistle, verse 14, as men that held the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit spiritual fornication. 
Numbers 25, 1 to 18, and 31, 16. For Balaam taught the Moabites and Midianites to tempt and invite Israel by their women to commit fornication and to feast with them at the sacrifices of their gods. The dragon, therefore, began now to come down among the inhabitants of the earth and sea. The Nicolaitans are also complained of in the fourth epistle under the name of the woman Jezebel, who called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce the servants of Christ to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. The woman, therefore, began now to fly into the wilderness. The reign of Constantine the Great from the time of his conquering Licinius was monarchical over the whole Roman Empire. Then the empire became divided between the sons of Constantine, and afterwards it was again united under Constantius by his victory over Magnentius. To the affairs of the church in these three successive periods of time, the third, fourth, and fifth epistles, that is, those to the angels of the churches in Pergamus, Thyatira, and Sardis, seem to relate. The next emperor was Julian the Apostate. In the sixth epistle to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, Christ saith, Because in the reign of the heathen emperor Julian thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which by the woman's flying into the wilderness, and the dragon's making war with the remnant of her seed, and the killing of all who will not worship the image of the beast, shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth, and to distinguish them by sealing the one with the name of God in their foreheads, and marking the other with the mark of the beast. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out of it. And I will write upon him the name of my God in his forehead. So the Christians of the church of Philadelphia, as many of them as overcome, are sealed with the seal of God, and placed in the second temple, and go no more out, the same is to be understood of the church in Smyrna, which also kept the word of God's patience, and was without fault. These two churches with their posterity are therefore the two pillars, and the two candlesticks, and the two witnesses in the second temple. After the reign of the emperor Julian, and his successor Jovian, who reigned but five months, the empire became again divided between Valentinian and Valens. Then the Church Catholic and the epistle to the angel of the Church of Laodicea is reprehended as lukewarm and threatened to be spewed out of Christ's mouth. She said that she was rich and increased with goods and had need of nothing, being in outward prosperity, and knew not that she was inwardly wretched and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. She is therefore spewed out of Christ's mouth at the opening of the seventh seal, and this puts an end to the times of the first temple. About one half of the Roman Empire turned Christians in the time of Constantine, the Great, and his sons. After Julian had opened the temples and restored the worship of the heathens, the emperors Valentinian and Valens tolerated it all their reign. And therefore the prophecy of the sixth seal was not fully accomplished before the reign of their successor Gratian. It was the custom of the heathen priests in the beginning of the reign of every sovereign emperor to offer him the dignity and habit of the Pontifex Maximus. This dignity all emperors had hitherto accepted, but Gratian rejected it, threw down the idols, interdicted the sacrifices, and took away their revenues with the salaries and authority of the priests. Theodosius the Great followed his example, and heathenism afterwards recovered itself no more, but decreased so fast that Prudentius, about ten years after the death of Theodosius, called the heathens merely a few intellectuals and a minute fraction of mankind. Once the affairs of the sixth seal ended with the reign of Valens, or rather with the beginning of the reign of Theodosius when he, 
like his predecessor Gratian, rejected the dignity of Pontifus Maximus. For the Romans were very much infested by the invasions of foreign nations in the reign of Valentinian and Valens. At this time, saith Ammianus, you might have thought that through the whole Roman world trumpets were blowing for war, and that excited by the sound, the fiercest tribes were leaping across the frontiers that lay nearest to them. The Gallic and Grecian provinces were simultaneously ravaged by the Almani, the provinces of Pannonia by the Sarmati and the Quadi, while the Britons were being constantly harassed and raided by the Picts, Saxons, Scots, and Atticati. The Astorians and the other Moorish tribes made deeper incursions than usual into the province of Africa. The Thracian provinces were plundered by marauding bands of Goths, and the king of Persia was always sending his forces against the Armenians. And whilst the emperors were busy in repelling these enemies, the Huns and Alans and Goths came over the Danube in two bodies, overcame and slew Valens, and made so great a slaughter of the Roman army that Ammianus saith, no action in history with the exception of Cannae was ever carried to a bloodier termination than this. These wars were not fully stopped on all sides till the beginning of the reign of Theodosius, AC 379 and 380. But thenceforward, the empire remained quiet from foreign armies till his death, AC 395. So long the four winds were held, and so long there was silence in heaven, and the seventh seal was opened when this silence began. Mr. Mead hath explained the prophecy of the first six trumpets not much amiss, but if he had observed that the prophecy of pouring out the vials of wrath is synchronal to that of sounding the trumpets, his explanation would have been yet more complete. The name of woes is given to the wars to which the three last trumpets sound, to distinguish them from the wars of the four first. The sacrifices on the first four days of the Feast of Tabernacles, at which the first four trumpets sound and the first four vials of wrath are poured out, are slaughters in four great wars, and these wars are represented by four winds from the four corners of the earth. The first was an east wind, the second a west wind, the third a south wind, and the fourth a north wind. With respect to the city of Rome, the metropolis of the old Roman Empire, these four plagues fell upon the third part of the earth, sea, rivers, sun, moon, and stars. That is, upon the earth, sea, rivers, sun, moon, and stars of the third part of the whole scene of these prophecies of Daniel and John. The plague of the eastern wind at the sounding of the first trumpet was to fall upon the earth, that is, upon the nations of the Greek empire. Accordingly, after the death of Theodosius, the great, the Goths, Sarmatians, Huns, Isaurians, and Austrian Moors invaded and miserably wasted Greece, Thrace, Asia Minor, Armenia, Syria, Egypt, Libya, and Illyricum for 10 or 12 years together. The plague of the western wind at the sounding of the second trumpet was to fall upon the sea, or western empire, by means of a great mountain burning with fire cast into it and turning it to blood. Accordingly, in the year 407, that empire began to be invaded by the Visigoths, Vandals, Alans, Sweves, Burgundians, Ostrogoths, Herili, Quade, Jeopardies, and by these wars it was broken into ten kingdoms and miserably wasted, and Rome itself, the burning mountain, was besieged and taken by the Ostrogoths in the beginning of these miseries. The plague of the southern wind at the sounding of the third trumpet was to cause a great star, burning as it were a lamp, to fall from heaven upon the rivers and fountains of waters. The western empire now divided into many kingdoms and to turn them to wormwood and blood and make them bitter. Accordingly, Genseric, 
the king of the Vandals and islands in Spain, AC 427, entered Africa with an army of 80,000 men, where he invaded the Moors and made war upon the Romans, both there and on the seacoast of Europe for 50 years together, almost without intermission, taking Hippo, AC 431, and Carthage, the capital of Africa, AC 439. In AC 455, with a numerous fleet and an army of 300,000 Vandals and Moors, he invaded Italy, took and plundered Rome, Naples, Capua, and many other cities, carrying thence their wealth with the flower of the people into Africa, and the next year, AC 456, he rent all Africa from the empire, totally expelling the Romans. Then the Vandals invaded and took the islands of the Mediterranean, Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, Abessus, Majorca, Minorca, etc., and Rissimer besieged the emperor Antimias in Rome, took the city, and gave his soldiers the plunder. AC 472. The Visigoths, about the same time, drove the Romans out of Spain, and now the western emperor, the great star which fell from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, having by all of these wars, gradually lost almost all his dominions, was invaded and conquered in one year by Odaeser, king of the Heruli, AC 476. After this, the Moors revolted, AC 477, and weakened the Vandals by several wars and took Mauritania from them. These wars continued till the Vandals were conquered by Belisarius. AC 534, and by all these wars, Africa was almost depopulated. According to Procopius, who reckons that about five millions of men perished in them. When the Vandals first invaded Africa, that country was very populous, consisting of about 700 bishoprics, more than were in all France, Spain, and Italy together. But by the wars between the Vandals, Romans, and Moors, it was depopulated to that degree. That Procopius tells us it was next to a miracle for a traveler to see a man. And pouring out the third vial, it is said, Thou art righteous, O Lord, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of thy saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. How they shed the blood of saints may be understood by the following edict of the Emperor Honorius, procured by four bishops, sent to him by a council of African bishops, who met at Carthage, 14 June, A.C. 410. The emperors Honorius and Theodosius to Heraclianus, governor of Africa. Quote, Now that the shrine whither they stole to practice their rites of heretical superstition has been utterly demolished, let all enemies of the holy law take notice that they will suffer the punishment both of outlawry and of blood. If henceforth in their accursed and criminal insolence they attempt to assemble in public, given on the 25th August in the consulship of Veronis AC 410, which edict was five years after fortified by the following, the emperors Honorius and Theodosius to Heraclianus, governor of Africa, quote, let all enemies of the holy law who in heretical superstition have crept to the performance of their rites. Take notice that they must suffer the punishment both of outlawry and of blood if henceforth they essay to assemble in public impudently to practice this abomination. This we command lest anywhere reverence for the true God should by contagion with them be defiled. Given on the 25th August in the consulship of Honorius and Theodosius, AC 415. These edicts being directed to the governor of Africa extended only to the Africans. Before these, there were many severe ones against the Donatists, but they did not extend to blood. These two were the first which made their meetings and the meetings of all dissenters capital. For by heretics in these edicts, are meant all dissenters, as is manifest by the following against Eurysius, a Luciferian bishop. The emperors Arcadius and Honorius to Aurelianus, procurator of 
Africa. Quote, all who have even on trivial evidence been found to dissent from the judgment of the Catholic Church and to deviate from its course or within the meaning of the word heretic and must come under the laws enacted against them. That three non sept consentinop a libero and probino cost AC 395. The Greek emperor Zeno adopted Theoderic, king of the Ostrogoths, to be his son made him master of the horse and Protitius and consul of Constantinople, and recommending to him the Roman people and Senate, gave him the Western Empire and sent him into Italy against Odesser, king of the Heruli. Theoderic thereupon led his nation into Italy, conquered Odesser, and reigned over Italy, Sicily, Rietia, Noricum, Dalmatia, Liburnia, Istria and part of Suevia, Panania and Gallia, whence Enodius said in a panegyric to Theoderic that he had restored the Roman Empire to its ancient frontiers. Theoderic reigned with great prudence, moderation, and felicity, treated the Romans with singular benevolence, governed them by their own laws, and restored their government under their senate and consuls. He himself supplying the place of emperor without assuming the title. So far did he excel his predecessors, saith Procopius, that in truth he lacked no glory meet for an emperor. He had a great love of justice and was constant in the protection he afforded to the law. He preserved his territory intact from the neighboring barbarians, etc., whence I do not reckon the reign of the king amongst the plagues of the four winds." The plague of the northern wind at the sounding of the fourth trumpet was to cause the sun, moon, and stars, that is, the king, kingdom, and princes of the western empire to be darkened and to continue some time in darkness. Accordingly, Belisarius, having conquered the Vandals, invaded Italy, A.C. 535, and made war upon the Ostrogoths and Dalmatia, Liburnia, Venetia, Lombardy, Tuscany, and other regions northward from Rome, 20 years together. In this war, many cities were taken and retaken. In retaking Milan from the Romans, the Ostrogoths slew all the males, young and old, amounting, as Procupius reckons, to 300,000, and sent the women captives to their allies, the Burgundians. Rome itself was taken and retaken several times, and thereby the people were thinned. The old government by a senate ceased, the nobles were ruined, and all the glory of the city was extinguished. And A.C. 552, after a war of 17 years, the kingdom of the Ostrogoths fell. Yet the remainder of the Ostrogoths and an army of Germans called in to their assistance continued the war three or four years longer. Then ensued the war of the Heruli, who, as Anastasius tells us, Perambant Conctum Italiam, slew all Italy. This was followed by the war of the Lombards, the fiercest of all the barbarians, which began A.C. 568 and lasted for 38 years together, with slaughter, saith Anastasius. Such as cannot be recalled in the past, ending at the last in the papacy of Sabinian. AC 605, by a peace then made with the Lombards. Three years before this war ended, Gregory the Great, then Bishop of Rome, thus speaks of it. In no words of description can we fully tell how, for a period now of 35 years, we have been harassed with daily fighting and numerous incursions of the Longobardi. And in one of his sermons to the people, he thus expresses the great consumption of the Romans by these wars. Your own eyes behold how few of you remain out of a once countless people. And even yet, day after day, one scourge and another harries us. Sudden misfortunes overwhelm us. New and unforeseen disasters crush us. In another sermon, he thus describes the desolations. Our cities are destroyed, our armaments overthrown, our fields laid waste, our land made a wilderness. 
None now lives in the country, and there is hardly a single dweller left in the cities. And yet these small remnants of the human race, endlessly, day by day, are still under the lash and the scourging of wrath divine knows no end. And Rome, that once was thought the mistress of the world, or I see all this that is left of her, wasted in countless ways by countless sorrows by the desolations of her citizens, the violence of the foe and the recurrence of disasters. Lo, all the powerful men of this generation have been swept away from her. See, the peoples are in revolt. Where is the Senate? Where are the people? Their bones have wasted away and their flesh has smoldered. For the whole order of lay dignitaries is extinct. And yet we few who survive ever day by day, we are threatened by the sword and by countless tribulations. A tenantless Rome is in her agony. But why speak such words of men only when we see the very houses tumbling down as disasters multiply? Even the walls fall when men forsake them. See now Rome is desolated. See she is broken. See she is overwhelmed with sorrow, etc. All this was spoken by Gregory to the people of Rome, who were witnesses of the truth of it. Thus, by the plagues of the four winds, the empire of the Greeks was shaken, and the empire of the Latins fell, and Rome remained nothing more than the capital of a poor dukedom, subordinate to Ravenna, the seat of the Exarchs. The fifth trumpet sounded to the wars which the king of the south, as he is called by Daniel, made in the time of the end, and pushing at the king who did according to his will. This plague began with the opening of the bottomless pit, which denotes the letting out of a false religion, the smoke which came out of the pit, signifying the multitude which embraced that religion, and the locusts which came out of the smoke, the armies which came out of that multitude, this pit was opened, to let out smoke and locusts into the regions of the four monarchies, or some of them, The king of these locusts was the angel of the bottomless pit, being chief governor as well in religious as civil affairs, such as was the caliph of the Saracens. Swarms of locusts often arise in Arabia, Felix, and from thence infest the neighboring nations, and so are a very fit type of the numerous armies of Arabians invading the Romans. They began to invade them in A.C. 634, and to reign at Damascus, A.C. 637. They built Baghdad, A.C. 766, and reigned over Persia, Syria, Arabia, Egypt, Africa, and Spain. They afterwards lost Africa to Mahadis in A.C. 910, Media, Hyrcania, Khorasan, and all Persia to the Delamites between the years 927 and 935. Mesopotamia and Miafarican to Nasserdud, Dallas, AC 930, Syria and Egypt to Akshid, AC 935, and now being in great distress, the Caliph of Baghdad, AC 936, surrendered all the rest of his temporal power to Muhammad, the son of Rajishki, king of Vasat in Chaldea, and made him emperor of emperors. But Muhammad, within two years, lost Baghdad to the Turks, and thenceforward Baghdad was sometimes in the hands of the Turks and sometimes in the hands of the Saracens, till Togrobeg, called also Togra, Togrisa, Tengrolipix, and Sadak, conquered Khorasan and Persia, A.C. 1055, added Baghdad to his empire, making it the seat thereof. His successors, Olab Arslan and Meleksha, conquered the regions upon Euphrates, and these conquests after the death of Meleksha break into the kingdoms of Armenia, Mesopotamia, Syria, and Cappadocia. The whole time that the caliphs of the Saracens reigned with a temporal dominion at Damascus and Baghdad together, was 300 years, viz. from the year 637 to the year 936, inclusive. Now locusts live but five months, and therefore, for the decorum of the type, 
These locusts are said to hurt men five months and five months, as if they had lived about five months at Damascus and again about five months at Baghdad, in all ten months or 300 prophetic days, which are years. The sixth trumpet sounded to the wars which Daniel's king of the north made against the king above mentioned who did according to his will. In these wars, the king of the north, according to Daniel, conquered the empire of the Greeks and also Judea, Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. And by these conquests, the empire of the Turks was set up, as may be known by the extent thereof. These wars commenced A.C. 1258, when the four kingdoms of the Turks seated upon Euphrates, that of Armenia, major seated at Myaferikin, Megurkin, or Mariopolis. That of Mesopotamia, seated at Mosul, that of Syria, seated at Aleppo, and that of Cappadocia, seated at Iconium, were invaded by the Tartars under Hulaku, and driven into the western parts of Asia Minor, where they made war upon the Greeks and began to erect the present empire of the Turks. Upon the sounding of the sixth trumpet, John heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loosed the four angels, which are bound at the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. By the four horns of the golden altar is signified the situation of the head cities of the said four kingdoms, Maya, Farrakhan, Mosul, Aleppo, and Iconium, which were in a quadrant angle. They slew the third part of men when they conquered the Greek Empire and took Constantinople, A.C. 1453. And they began to be prepared for this purpose when Olab Arslan began to conquer the nations upon Euphrates, A.C. 1063. The interval is called an hour and a day and a month and a year, or 391 prophetic days, which are years. In the first 30 years, Olab Arslan and Melekshia conquered the nations upon Euphrates and reigned over the whole. Melekshia died AC 1092 and was succeeded by a little child, and then this kingdom broke into the four kingdoms above mentioned. The End Advertisement. The last pages of these observations having been differently drawn up by the author in another copy of his work, they are here inserted as they follow in that copy, after the 37th line of the 312th page foregoing. And none was found worthy to open the book till the Lamb of God appeared. The great high priest represented by a lamb slain at the foot of the altar in the morning sacrifice, and he came and took the book out of the hand of him that sat upon the throne. For the high priest in the feast of the seventh month went into the most holy place and took the book of the law out of the right side of the ark to read it to the people. And in order to read it well, he studied it seven days, that is, upon the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth days, being attended by some of the priests to hear him perform. These seven days are alluded to by the Lamb's opening the seven seals successively. Upon the tenth day of the month, a young bullock was offered for a sin offering for the high priest and a goat for a sin offering for the people. And lots were cast upon two goats to determine which of them should be God's lot for the sin offering. And the other goat was called Azazel, the scapegoat. The high priest in his linen garments took a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar, his hand being full of sweet incense beaten small and went into the most holy place within the veil, and put the incense upon the fire, and sprinkled the blood of the bullock with his finger upon the mercy seat, and before the mercy seat seven times. And then he killed the goat which fell to God's lot, for a sin offering for the people, 
and brought his blood within the veil and sprinkled it also seven times upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Then he went out to the altar and sprinkled it also seven times with the blood of the bullock and as often with the blood of the goat. After this, he laid both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confessed over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and sent him away into the wilderness by the hands of a fit man. And the goat bore upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. Leviticus chapter 4 and chapter 16. While the high priest was doing these things in the most holy place and at the altar, the people continued at their devotion quietly and in silence. Then the high priest went into the holy place, put off his linen garments, and put on other garments. Then came out and sent the bullock and the goat of the sin offering to be burnt without the camp, with fire taken in a censer from the altar. And as the people returned home from the temple, they said to one another, God seal you to a good new year. In allusion to all this, when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And an angel stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar, and cast it to the earth, suppose without the camp, for sacrificing the goat which fell to God's lot. For the high priest being Christ himself, the bullock is omitted. At this sacrifice, there were voices and thunderings of the music of the temple and lightnings of the sacred fire and an earthquake. And synchronal to these things was the sealing of the 144,000 out of all the 12 tribes of the children of Israel with the seal of God in their foreheads, while the rest of the 12 tribes received the mark of the beast. And the woman fled from the temple into the wilderness to her place upon this beast. For this scaling and marking was represented by casting lots upon the two goats, sacrificing God's lot on Mount Sion, and sending the scapegoat into the wilderness, loaden with the sins of the people. Upon the fifteenth day of the month and the six following days, there were very great sacrifices. And in allusion to the sounding of trumpets and singing with thundering voices and pouring out drink offerings at those sacrifices, seven trumpets are sounded, and seven thunders utter their voices, and seven vials of wrath are poured out. Wherefore the sounding of the seven trumpets, the voices of the seven thunders, and the pouring out of the seven vials of wrath are synchronal and relate to one and the same division of the time of the seventh seal, following the silence into seven successive parts. The seven days of this feast were called the Feast of Tabernacles, and during these seven days the children of Israel dwelt in booths and rejoiced with palm branches in their hands. To this alludes the multitude with palms in their hands, which appeared after the sealing of the 144,000 and came out of the great tribulation with triumph at the battle of the great day, to which the seventh trumpet sounds. The visions, therefore, of the 144,000 and of the palm-bearing multitude extend to the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and therefore are synchronal to the times of the seventh seal. When the 144,000 are sealed out of all the twelve tribes of Israel, and the rest receive the mark of the beast, and thereby the first temple is destroyed. John is bidden to measure the temple and altar, that is their courts and them that worship therein, that is the 144,000 standing on Mount Sion and on the sea of glass. But the court that is without the temple, that is the people's court, to leave out and measure it not, because it is given to the Gentiles those who receive the mark of the beast, and the holy city they shall 
tread underfoot forty and two months. That is all the time that the beast acts under the woman Babylon, and the two witnesses prophesy twelve hundred sixty days. That is all the same time clothed in sackcloth. These have power, like Elijah, to shut heaven that it rain not at the sounding of the first trumpet, and like Moses to turn the waters into blood at the sounding of the second, and to smite the earth with all plagues those of the trumpets as often as they will. These prophesy at the building of the second temple, like Haggai and Zechariah. These are the two olive trees, or churches, which supplied the lamps with oil. Zechariah 4. These are the two candlesticks, or churches, standing before the God of the earth. Five of the seven churches of Asia, those in prosperity, are found fault with, and exhorted to repent, and threatened to be removed out of their places, or spewed out of Christ's mouth, or punished with the sword of Christ's mouth, except they repent. The other two, the churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia, which were under persecution, remain in a state of persecution to illuminate the second temple. When the primitive church Catholic, represented by the woman in heaven, apostatized and became divided into two corrupt churches, represented by the whore of Babylon and the two-horned beast, the 144,000 who were sealed out of all the twelve tribes became the two witnesses in opposition to those two false churches, and the name of two witnesses, once imposed, remains to the true church of God in all times and places to the end of the prophecy. In the interpretation of this prophecy, the woman in heaven clothed with the sun, before she flies into the wilderness, represents the primitive church Catholic, illuminated with the seven lamps in the seven golden candlesticks which are the seven churches of Asia. The dragon signifies the same empire with Daniel's, he goat, in the reign of his last horn. That is, the whole Roman Empire until it became divided into the Greek and Latin empires. And all the time of that division, it signifies the Greek Empire alone. And the beast is Daniel's fourth beast, that is, the empire of the Latins before the division of the Roman Empire into the Greek and Latin empires, the beast is included in the body of the dragon, and from the time of that division, the beast is the Latin Empire only. Hence, the dragon and beast have the same heads and horns, but the heads are crowned upon the dragon and the horns upon the beast. The horns are ten kingdoms into which the beast becomes divided presently after his separation from the dragon as hath been described above. The heads are seven successive dynasties, or parts, into which the Roman Empire becomes divided by the opening of the seven seals. Before the woman fled into the wilderness, she being with child of a Christian empire, cried travailing, viz. in the ten years' persecution of Diocletian and pain to be delivered. And the dragon, the heathen Roman Empire, stood before her, to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who at length was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne in the temple. By the victory of Constantine the Great over Maxentius, and the woman fled from the temple into the wilderness of Arabia to Babylon, where she hath a place of riches and honor and dominion upon the back of the beast prepared of God that they should feed her there 1260 days. And there was war in heaven between the heathens under Maximinus and the new Christian empire, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent which deceiveth the whole world, the spirit of heathen idolatry, who was cast out of the throne into the earth, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto the death. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, stirring up a new persecution against her in the reign of Licinius. And to the woman by the building of Constantinople, and equaling it to Rome, 
were given two wings of a great eagle that she might flee into the wilderness, into her place upon the back of her beast, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent upon the death of Constantine, the great, cast out of his mouth water as a flood. It is the Western Empire under Constantine, Junior and Constans, after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth, the nations of Asia now under Constantinople, help the woman, and by conquering the Western Empire, now under Magnentius, swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which in that war were sealed out of all the twelve tribes of Israel, and remained upon Mount Sion with the Lamb, being in number 144,000, and having their father's name written in their foreheads. When the earth had swallowed up the flood, and the dragon was gone to make war with the remnant of the woman's seed, John stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and the beast was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. John here names Daniel's four beasts in order, putting his beast in the room of Daniel's fourth beast, to shew that they are the same. And the dragon gave this beast his power and his seat and great authority by relinquishing the Western Empire to him. And one of his heads, the six, was as it were wounded to death viz by the sword of the earth, which swallowed up the waters cast out of the mouth of the dragon, and his deadly wound was healed by a new division of the empire between Valentinian and Valens. And 364. John saw the beast rise out of the sea at the division thereof between Gratian and Theodosius, and 379. The dragon gave the beast his power and his seat in great authority at the death of Theodosius, when Theodosius gave the western empire to his son Honorius, after which the two empires were no more united. The western empire became presently divided into ten kingdoms, as above, and these kingdoms at length united in religion under the woman and reign with her forty and two months. And I beheld, saith John, another beast coming up out of the earth. When the woman fled from the dragon into the kingdom of the beast and became his church, this other beast rose up out of the earth to represent the church of the dragon, for he had two horns like the lamb, such as were the bishoprics of Alexandria and Antioch. And he spake as the dragon in matters of religion, and he causeth the earth or nations of the dragon's kingdom to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed, that is, to be of his religion. And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That is, he excommunicateth those who differ from him in point of religion, for in pronouncing their excommunications, they used to swing down a lighted torch from above. And he said to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. That is, that they should call a council of men of the religion of this beast, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed, viz. mystically by dissolving their churches. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. That is, the mark, which for your purposes looks a little bit like a Templar's cross, or the name, Latinos, or the number thereof, which is Greek for 666, all others are excommunicated. When the seven angels had poured out the seven vials of wrath, and John had described them all in the present 
time. He is called up from the time of the seventh vial to the time of the sixth seal. To take a view of the woman and her beast, who were to reign in the times of the seventh seal, in respect of the latter part of time of the sixth seal, then considered as present, the angel tells John, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the abyss and go into perdition. That is, he was in the reign of Constans and Magnentius until Constantius conquered Magnentius and reunited the Western Empire to the Eastern. He is not during the reunion, and he shall ascend out of the abyss or sea at a following division of the empire. The angel tells him further, Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, on which the woman sitteth, Rome being built upon seven hills, and thence called the seven-hilled city. Also there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. Five are fallen, the times of the five first seals being passed, and one is the time of the sixth seal being considered as present. And another is not yet come. And when he cometh, which will be at the opening of the seventh seal, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. By means of the division of the Roman Empire into two collateral empires, and is of the seven, being one half of the seventh and shall go into perdition. The words five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet come are usually referred by interpreters to the time of John the Apostle. When the prophecy was given. But it is to be considered that in this prophecy, many things are spoken of as present, which were not present when the prophecy was given, but which would be present with respect to some future time considered as present in the visions. Thus, where it is said upon pouring out the seventh vial of wrath, that great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. This relates not to the time of John the Apostle, but to the time of pouring out the seventh vial of wrath. So where it is said Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and thrust in the sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, and the time of the dead is come, that they should be judged. And again I saw the dead small and great stand before God. These sayings relate not to the days of John the Apostle, but to the latter times considered as present in the visions. In like manner, the words five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and the beast that was and is not, he is the eighth, are not to be referred to the age of John the Apostle, but relate to the time when the beast was to be wounded to death with a sword, and shew that this wound was to be given him in his sixth head. And without this reference, we are not told in what head the beast was wounded. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. They have one mind, being all of the horse religion, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, composing her beast. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire at the end of the twelve sixty days. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth, or the great city of the Latins, which reigneth over the ten kings till the end of those days. Finis.